Well, good morning. Hey, that was really good. I've trained you well. Oh, you know what I'm going to ask, right? Who did their homework? Hey, good. Challenge you this week, read Ephesians again. I think as we walk through this, and really once we're past chapter one, we're going to speed it up significantly. I think as you go back to read, stuff's going to start to jump out to you. Oh yeah, we learned what that word means and stuff like that. So uh, thank you. That's encouraging to me to, to see so many hands, if you're telling the truth, that is. And so let's pray. We're going to keep going here. And uh, by God's grace, next week we'll finish chapter one, and then we'll uh, hopefully be done Ephesians by, I don't know, Christmas time or something. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your love, for everything we learned this morning in adult Sunday school, everything we got to do for our service here this morning. And <clears throat> even as we step back into Ephesians here and, and change gears a bit, we're just thankful for your heart for us, that you have given us your word, that indeed Paul wrote this, church, this letter to a specific church, and yet writing to Gentile Christians, much of this applies to us. What you've done for them, you did for us. Uh, who they were in Christ is who we are in Christ. And so, Lord, we're amazed that you've preserved and given us your word. And even as has been prayed this morning, we just continue to pray that you would give us the grace to continue to grow in unity and love for each other and for you. And we pray that this message would help to further that, further that goal. So, Holy Spirit, I ask this morning that you would work in hearts and lives. We believe in you. We believe that you work in hearts and lives. We believe that you convict people of their sin. We, we, we know and trust that you work in amazing ways. And so we pray that you would do that here this morning. Give me the grace to do that as well. And we thank you that you're willing to use those who are willing to submit to you. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to do 7 to 14 today. Hopefully it'll be, it'll be good. So something we have to settle in our minds as we sort of walk through Ephesians together is what the Bible has to say about you is true if you are a believer in Christ. And so we've talked about a lot of things so far, right? We've talked about the fact that God has blessed us, the fact that God has chosen us, the fact that God has accepted us. This week we're going to talk about, I think, five or six more things. And these things are true of us, whether we feel them or not, whether our, our experience necessarily matches up with it. Even when my life isn't consistent with what the Bible says, what the Bible has to say about me is true. And so we have to continue to trust the Lord and, and grow in that. Um, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus because he wants them to live a life worthy of their calling. We'll learn more about that in chapter 4. He wants them to grow into mature Christians who honor God by living out their calling faithfully. And so in order to better accomplish this goal— he doesn't begin Ephesians by telling these believers what they had to do. And he could have done that. There was plenty of things they had to do. Instead, which is the way of grace, as we talked about our first week, he begins by reminding them of who they really are in Christ. And so for us, the great motivation for us to live the Christian life always has to be who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so the gospel message, his, his death and resurrection, everything that means, should be the center of all that we do and all that we are. Why? Because he is the center of all we do and all that we are. And so this week in Ephesians really is no different. We're going to continue to learn doctrine, deep spiritual doctrine found in the Bible about what Jesus has done for us and, um, and what that means for us today. And frankly, each of these points could be separate sermons, but I didn't want to be here till March going through Ephesians, though we certainly could have done that. And I know I will not do these truths justice this morning. I just don't have the time. But we're going to try to do our best. And so I'm just going to read the passage again. It's been read already. Uh, this is New King James, um, just for reference. And we'll read this. We'll get into it sort of a little bit verse by verse here, and hopefully it will be and encouragement to you. You'll notice over and over he uses the word in him. And so if you're a Christian, this applies to you. If you are in him, this applies to you. Here's what he says in verse 7. In him, that is Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, 
according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also, you notice, I mean, almost a dozen times in chapter 1, in him, in him, in him. It's like he's trying to communicate something here. Verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. One reason we're walking through chapter one really slow is if you've read chapter one, it's kind of a lot of information, isn't it? It kind of feels like a fire hose kind of being sprayed in your face. So much going on. And really, in the original language in chapter 1, Paul isn't even using much grammar. He's just kind of blasting it out there. He's, he's super excited. I assume if a guy was, was, was dictating, sort of you know, writing what he was dictating, they were writing pretty fast. He had a lot to say. He was really excited. And so I, I think this is a chapter that's easy to sort of read and, and skim over right? Paul's introducing new words and concepts, and these things are easy to miss. And so I want to take some time to talk about these things, to kind of define them and bring them out for us, and I hope this will be helpful to us. So last week we talked in in verse 5 about predestination and election. And of course, I think we like to sort of jump on that bandwagon and have that debate, but I think in doing so, we can miss out on what God actually wants us to learn from the passage. And so something in verse 5 that we, that we didn't talk much about is this idea of adoption. Adoption. What does it mean that we're adopted into God's family? Here's what he said in verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Let's talk about this idea of adoption. Galatians 3.26 has a very blunt statement. Again, Paul writing this in Galatians. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And so it's clear in the Bible that the moment you believe in Jesus, God adopts you into his family. He adopts you into his family. And by the way, this is a tremendous truth. A tremendous truth that we, we should not miss, considering that we were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. So there seems to be both a a present aspect to adoption, I am adopted into his family, but there seems to be in scripture as well a future aspect to this adoption where he sort of places us into our our position. 1 John 3 verse 2, an incredible verse, says this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is a whole sermon right there in that verse. Romans eight nineteen to 21 as well says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. That's us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but because of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And so the Bible says all of creation is waiting for Christ to return so we can be revealed as the sons of God. And so that's pretty incredible because we already are sons of God, children of God, if we've trusted in Jesus. But one day the whole world will know who we really are. That's pretty crazy. Right? Because inwardly, inwardly, something has changed about us, the Bible says. When we place our faith in Jesus, the Bible says we've been born again. We've been made into new creatures. And yet on the outside, we look just like everyone else. We get sick, we get old, someday we will die. The world sees us as being the same as them, but in reality, we couldn't be more different. We are the children of God. We are the children of God, and not everybody in the world is, right? It's a major false teaching to say everybody in the world is God's child. That's not true. Non-Christians, the Bible says, are enemies of God, in fact. Now, as we talk about this idea of adoption, when, when, when we think of adoption in, in sort of North American thinking, it's very different than what Paul meant here in Ephesians. 
he really has, has the adoption he had in his culture, the, kind of the Roman Empire version of adoption. Here's a quote I found online. I'm going to read it for you. I think it's helpful to, to understand uh, what it means for us to be adopted by God. Here's what it says. Quote, Any new baby in the Roman culture had to be accepted by the father of the family. Traditionally, the midwife placed the newborn at his feet, and only if the father of the family picked it up would the baby become a formal part of the family. The father had the authority to disown and sell his children into slavery should they anger him. Not so, however, if a child is adopted. In Rome, adopting a child meant, number one, that child was freely chosen by the parents and desired by those parents. Number two, that child would become a permanent part of the family, and in fact, the parents couldn't disown a child they adopted. An adopted child received a new identity. Any prior commitments, responsibilities, and debts were erased. New rights and responsibilities were taken on. Also in ancient Rome, the concept of inheritance was part of life, not just something that began at death. And so being adopted made someone an heir to their father, joint sharers in all of his possessions, and fully united to him, end quote. And so when Paul says we're adopted into God's family, we aren't some lesser or secondary sort of stepchild to God. No, in fact, we are given the full rights of a blood-related son. That's pretty incredible. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says this, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Jesus himself in John 8, 35 and 36, don't have it on the screen for you, he said, And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So here's the good news so far in verse 5 in Ephesians. God is no longer our judge, but our heavenly father. That's quite the difference. To, to be your enemy and, and to be your judge and to have that change into being your adopted heavenly father is pretty, pretty incredible. Now in verse 7, since we have so much to get through, he talks about this idea. He says, in him, we have redemption through his blood. What does it mean when the Bible says we are redeemed? When we are redeemed. The idea really of, of redemption or being redeemed really is a ransom being paid to set someone free. So a couple of questions maybe come to mind. Who was the one who was captive? Who paid the ransom? And who was the ones who were set free? I think that's an obvious answer, right? Of course, what was the ransom? The verse tells us the blood of Christ was the ransom. And of course, us being the captives, what did God free us from? He freed us from our sin. He freed us from the power of Satan. He freed us from God's wrath. What I didn't get into is, of course, who this ransom was paid to. That's a whole other sermon because God paid himself essentially, but we won't get into that. But fairly incredible that we were slaves, we were captives, and yet because Jesus died for us, because his blood was shed, we have been redeemed, we have been bought. And Paul even says in Corinthians, you have been bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies, right? Pretty incredible. The death of Jesus has set us free from sin, Satan, and hell. And by the way, you see the verse... He says, we have redemption. There it is again, that past tense use, right? So it's not that we will be redeemed, it's that we are, we have been redeemed. In verse 7 as well, he talks about this idea, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. This is sort of the common thing we believe. I believe in Jesus and my sins are forgiven. But there's a lot more going on in this verse, I think, that maybe we, we often understand. And, and the forgiveness of sins is very different than what happened in the Old Testament. See, in the Old Testament, people were sort of forgiven. Their sin was covered. God, God passed over it for a time, right? But the Jewish people would always have to go back to the altar. They would always have to go and, and sacrifice the animal because their sin was never fully dealt with. Of course, the Gentile had even less than that. And yet in Jesus, 
we have something so much better. Hebrews 10, which I highly recommend you read the whole chapter there. Verses 11 to 14, here's what it says. And every priest, that is the Jewish priest, stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Who are those being sanctified? Christians. So the Bible says, because of what Jesus has done for you, you have been perfected forever. That is really an incredible truth, that our sin is not just forgiven in the past, but also in the present and also in the future. In fact, in Romans 4, 7 and 8, he says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Did you catch what that verse says? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not credit or impute or, or count against us our sin. And so it's not just that God forgives us of our past sins. It's that every future sin we will ever commit as believers is no longer imputed or counted against us. What that means is that God, again, like I said, no longer counts our sin against us. And here's the thing, even though we do sin all the time, it's pretty crazy. Many of us, I think, sometimes walk in fear. Many believers walk in fear, thinking that only their past sins are forgiven. They wonder maybe if they don't keep up on confessing every single sin they commit, that they will somehow lose their salvation. You know, years ago I thought, well, well yeah, I have to confess my sins to God and He'll forgive me. What if I forget one? What if I forget one? Does that make me lost? Here's a question maybe to think through. How many of your sins were future to the cross? All of them, right? All of them. And so Jesus, Jesus didn't die for you if you're a believer. And of course, if you're not a believer, that's available for you. Jesus didn't die for you knowing that, excuse me, not knowing what you would do in the future because everything was future to the cross. He knows the future perfectly, and he knew well in advance all of your sins and your failures. And here's the good news. He died for you anyway. <laughs> Amen? That's crazy. He knew how I would live, what I would be, and he chose to die for me anyway. And so there is nothing you can do today or someday in the future that will change the fact that you are forgiven. Not just that forgiveness is available to you if you confess it, but that you stand in a permanent state of forgiven, if I can use that bad grammar. Now, some people might, might ask, doesn't this kind of teaching encourage people to sin? Well, if I'm forgiven, some may say, can't I just sin and face no consequences? Can't I just sin, do whatever I want? God doesn't count my sin against me anymore. Well, you do sin, and you can sin. We do all the time. And, and yes, sin doesn't change your status before God of being forgiven. But here's the thing. If you are truly a child of God, God will come for you when you sin. Who here, when you sin, God comes for you. He deals with you, right? God will discipline you as a good father does. But it's no longer about losing a relationship because we are adopted and we are purchased by him. But if you think you can get away with sin, even as a forgiven believer, you are gravely mistaken. And Hebrews chapter 12 says, if you can get away with it, there's a good chance you might not be one that is a believer. God will come for us and he will discipline us. And you know, God as our enemy is truly terrifying, but he is no less worthy of our fear as our father. Many of us had, some of us had fathers like that. We loved him, we respected him, but when, when we screwed up and he came home from work, we knew we were in for a licking, right? Amen? Some of us had fathers like that. It was, a, it was a holy sort of healthy fear, right, of our father. We don't fear hell from God, but we do, we should fear displeasing him. You even see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
talking about God's discipline. There's a man who's apparently sleeping with his father's wife, probably his stepmother, hopefully not his real mother, but probably his stepmother. And God says, Paul says through Paul, he says, look, hand this man over to Satan so he can die and his soul can be saved. Sometimes God can even discipline us straight to heaven. I think, that, I think, that's, I think I've met a few people in my life where that's happened to them. True believers who just weren't living right. Now, what about 1 John 1, 9? Who here knows 1 John 1, 9 by heart? Perfect. Gave me a chance to drink water. Thank you. That was the trap. If we confess our sins, she said, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why a verse like that if I'm already forgiven? It seems to be sort of the opposite of what I've been saying. Is passages like 1 John 1, 9 making my relationship with God conditional? Is it saying that until we confess our current sin and get right with God, that we're no longer in a relationship with him until we do? Well, in Ephesians, again, we've already established that our relationship with God is a settled matter, right? We don't lose our adoption. We don't lose our redemption because of a sin and gain it back when we confess our sin to him. That's actually Roman Catholicism, not evangelical Christianity. Then what's John's point in his letter? He is addressing fellowship with God, not our relationship. Let me give a couple of examples. It's very possible, for example, to be related to someone, but not be very close with them. Anyone have any relatives you never see, you never talk to? Are you still related to them? Yeah. Is it possible to be married to someone, but to lack intimacy with them? Yeah. Is it possible to even live in the same house as someone, but not know them very well? Yeah. And so we are called to confess our sin to God and to ask forgiveness, but it's because we already are in a relationship that we do this. We turn from sin and come to God because we want to please him. And so we don't confess our sin to get our relationship with God back, no, but to restore our fellowship with him. We do this in marriage all the time. Guys, gals, you're married. You get into a fight. Are you no longer married if you're fighting? Of course you're still married right? And when you sort of confess things, uh, apologize, right? That usually the guy has to apologize, amen, right? <laughs> Wives don't apologize, just the guys do, right? Usually, hey, guys, usually it's our fault, right? Right? 90%, hey, if I ever do marriage counseling, I'm going to tell you, 90% is our fault, guys. <clears throat> but that 10% is really annoying, ladies. It's really annoying. <laughs> it's a really big 10%, right? <laughs> We're going to do a fun series in the family next year. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really, really looking forward to that. Um, man. So our marriage doesn't end because we fight, right? So we get right with God because I want to be close with him again. It's exactly the same idea. It's not just that God will forgive you if you confess, but that you are forgiven. You stand in a state of forgiven. I think that's very important for us to realize. Because sometimes I think when we sin, especially if we sin, maybe a particular sin we've been struggling with for a long time, we sort of think, man, God isn't going to forgive me again. And so we kind of like to, to put ourselves in the penalty box and punish ourselves a bit, and then we'll come back. And yet God invites us to come back and get right with him, to come back into fellowship with him right away. He's not surprised by you messing up for the millionth time, which is great news for us. Not going to spend much time on these next two, but just for sake of reference, verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So God has revealed to us his will. Of course, he's primarily revealed his will through the Bible. Praise God, we have a complete Bible that we can read and study for ourselves. God has revealed his heart to us. And of course, there's some things maybe we wish God would tell us that he doesn't, but we know that he's given us at least what we need to know enough for us to grow and to walk as Christians. Now, it's funny. I, I didn't know what to say about this verse, Andy, but now I know. <laughs> you talked about the, uh, the, 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 the snowflakes coming together for the snowdrift. Well, here it is in verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And I have here in my notes, basically, that this means Jesus is going to come and resolve everything. And I think one thing he is going to resolve is disunity in the church. Thank you for the application. He's going to bring us together. 
In heaven someday, we're not, going to, we're not really going to be debating COVID or predestination or any of those things. We're going to understand. And so praise God, and we want to model that as best we can now and come together as best as we can now. But man, Jesus is going to come someday, and he is going to resolve everything. Bring us together, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. A future glory together with Christ. Man, that is something to look forward to. Amen? Man, no more fighting, no more division. We're looking forward to that. Here's where we get really, really interesting. Excuse me, verse 13 is what I meant. I'll read this though. I'm spending a month in chapter one. I couldn't extend it any further. There's still lots of info. <laughs> That's why I'm encouraging you to read on your own. There's just so much there. I love God's word. Verse 11 says this, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Notice as well, this is a present tense inheritance, not just a future one. But the verse doesn't really say much about what it is, and so I'm not really going to take time to guess. Apparently, we have an inheritance right now in Christ, probably very much related to everything we've been saying so far. All right, verse 13 and 14 is where we get really interesting and really intense. And I think this really caps off what he's been saying and really um, helps us to understand, I think, that our relationship with God is a settled matter. Here's what he says. These are, these are two verses worth studying in your spare time. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. <coughs> so this really is an intense uh, piece of truth. And I think even after everything we've tried to say this morning, a question still lingers maybe in some of our minds. Can all of this really be true? The fact that God has blessed me and chosen me and accepted me and forgiven me and redeemed me and given me an inheritance, can this all really be true? How can we be sure? Because sometimes I think we take a look inside of our hearts and, and we still see so much sin and evil in ourselves. I know I do. And sometimes maybe we think if, if there's even a sliver of a chance that this all can be lost, we sort of think that if anyone could find a way to mess this up, it's me. But here's the truth from this passage. The moment we trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is not an energy. He is a person. He is the eternal third person of the Trinity, God himself. He is addressed as a person in both the Old and New Testaments. Paul says we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This idea of being sealed is the same idea as, uh, during their time, a letter being sealed with hot wax to keep it closed. We see this all over the Bible with pagan kings will have a signet ring. They'll have a document, they will dip it in hot wax, and they will, they will seal it. One other place we see a seal is when Jesus dies, he's put into a tomb. A rock is rolled in front of the hole. What's put on the rock? Do you guys remember? A seal. A seal from the Roman government saying, if you open this rock, penalty of death. Now, of course, an angel doesn't care about that, so they broke the rule. But no human would break that seal under penalty of death. So how much more if we're the ones sealed by God? What does it mean to be sealed by the Holy Spirit? It means that when we believe, he comes to live inside of us. And when this happens, he never leaves. He is now, the Holy Spirit is now inside of us forever. You know, there's the old psalm, and, and often we sing this as a song. And I don't know what the song is called. Some of you guys may know. Where, where we sing, take not your Holy Spirit from me. You guys recall the psalm and the song we sing. That's actually unbiblical in the New Testament sense because the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, he came on people and he left, right? Now in the New Testament, he comes to live inside of us forever. It's very different than what happened before. The Holy Spirit is also the guarantee of our inheritance we have waiting for us in heaven. And really the best way we can describe this he talks about this idea of the guarantee. Guarantee means earnest or, or down payment. It's almost like a down payment on a house. 
Why do you make that first 10 or 20% payment on a new home? Because you want to reserve it for yourself. You've got to put that money down before somebody else does, right? Does anyone put 10% down on a house for no reason? Of course not. No, we, we do it because we plan to move into the house and we plan to eventually own it for ourselves, right? We give that first payment because we plan on fully paying it off someday. And so God has given us his spirit of promise because he wants us to know that he's good for the rest of the transaction. That's, that's amazing. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that he will come back and finish what he started in us. One commentator said it this way, quote, The seal is therefore the Holy Spirit himself, and his presence in the believer denotes ownership and security. The sealing with the Spirit is not an emotional feeling or some inward experience. One other author said this, quote, The word guarantee or down payment is used only in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit. He is our only down payment of coming glory. Nothing else is provided or needed. What's the point? Our salvation is secure in Christ. It is secure in Christ. I don't know how we get around verses like this when we bring up things like loss of salvation. And again, I mentioned this before. We did that series in August kind of questioning, are you a believer? Have you had an encounter with God? Because I knew I was heading here to Ephesians. And if you aren't a Christian here this morning, verses like this will drive you to more sin. You'll think, man, this is great. Now I can go sin. But if you are a believer in Christ, you cannot live that way. In fact, God will not let you live that way. And so, show of hands, have you believed in Christ? Nobody's believed in Christ for changing the sermon. Okay, if you, so th th this is the chain. If you believed in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, right? Okay, does the Holy Spirit live inside of you? Yes. So, so he's sealed in you forever. So if he lives inside of you, he is the guarantee of future glory. That is a chain I don't think that can be broken. It's pretty incredible. Man, that our relationship with God is settled. That is incredible. So let's finish up with a couple of thoughts and then we'll be done. In Christ, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We are chosen before the foundation of the world in him. We are accepted in the beloved. We have been adopted into his family. We have been redeemed from this world, from our sin, from Satan, and from eternal death. We have been forgiven not only of our past sins, but of all of our sin, past, present, and future. We have been given an inheritance. What that is, we don't know, but we know it's ours. Why? Because we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. Amen? Isn't that incredible? 14 verses of one chapter. This is everything the Bible says is true of you in Christ. It's as if Paul is trying to communicate something to us here in the passage. That if you are a true believer in Christ, your relationship with him is a settled matter in fact, before the foundation of the world. Now we can move forward in worship and obedience, not doubting this relationship anymore. And I know we all struggle with that at times. So what sort of response should we have to what we've read here this morning? I think one thing we should do is we need to believe it. We need to believe it. We need to believe what the Bible says about you and what, about I as believers. I think as well, to further grow in these, in these truths, you need to get into the Word. You need to study on your own. You need to grow in these things. That's why I've challenged you to read through Ephesians. If you have more time, read through Colossians. Read through Romans 1 to 8, which we're hoping to do next year, Lord willing. And read through those verses again, and don't just read them as some story from 2,000 years ago, but apply them to yourself. Don't just read the verse. Read them and say, I'm blessed, I'm chosen, I'm accepted, I'm adopted, I'm redeemed, I'm forgiven, I'm given an inheritance. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. I even have a document in my office that is 213 things that are now true of you if you are a Christian. You want a copy? I'll make one for you. There's, you, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got 200 and, what's 213 minus eight? 205 more things. Isn't that amazing? You didn't hire me for my math skills. It's important. 
I'll, I'll end by saying this. You know, I, I've been studying the Bible for, for close to 20 years, and, and I'm, still, I'm still learning. And, you know, it's, it's like I'm, I, I'm, I'm digging down into the Word, and, and when it feels like I, I've reached the bottom of what I think I know, a little crack appears, and, and I begin to dig away the, the, the crack, and it turns out that I can go even deeper inside. It, it's pretty incredible. The depths of what Paul is saying here in Ephesians have been studied for 2,000 years, and I don't think anyone has found the bottom to this diamond mine yet. It truly is a mine full of many treasures. The Bible truly is a living and powerful book, and there is great spiritual tre treasure here for those who are hungry enough to dig it in the Word. And again, whether you know these things or not, they are true of you, but for us to further grow in our faith, these things need to come into our hearts. I think our problem isn't that we lack anything from God. In fact, we, we've learned that we lack nothing. Our problem is that we lack the desire to get into the Word. And we lack that desire, and we are so distracted by the things of this world. Right? But it doesn't have to be that way. God invites us to take time studying His Word. Whatever your maturity is, whatever your level of knowledge is, He's inviting us to come and to read and to learn. Because we don't go to the Bible just for information, right? We go for transformation. We go to the Word expecting God to meet us there because He always will. I just wrote this out Saturday morning as I was doing my sermon run. This is what I wrote, and then we'll pray. I'm amazed every time I'm not in the Word how I think there's nothing much for me. Anyone here not been in their Bible for a month or two or longer and you kind of think, I'm not going to go back, I already know this stuff. And yet what happens every time you go back? Every time I go back to the Word, my old friend is always waiting for me. Isn't he? You get back to the Word and God is like, oh hey, I was waiting for you here. So that's my encouragement to you this morning. Get in the Word you won't be disappointed. Believe what it says about you and believe that when you open the word, God is waiting for you and wants to speak into your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you can use even my great imperfections to bring glory to yourself. I pray that I did that this morning. Each one here, Lord, is at a different point in life. Some people are figuring things out. Some people have known you for a long time. Each of us needs to grow in our faith in you and in realizing who you really are and what you've done for us in Christ. I just pray, Lord, that each one would take the time to study your word, to learn more and to grow, that they would gain passion for you even more than they have to share this with their friends, family, and neighbors. And Lord, that we would be a church that's on fire for you. Thank you, Lord, that doctrine isn't dry and boring, but that it's life-giving and powerful, and exciting. And I hope I communicated that this morning as best I can. Leaving here, Lord, we know there is so much to do. We know there is so much on many of our plates, but we thank you that we were given this time just to hear from you. And we pray that when we find time this week that we would sit down with you, get into your word, and be with you. Thank you, Lord, that you invite us there, that that, that, that invitation is always on the table. And we pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to do that. So, Lord, thank you. We uh, hope we can pray, uh, pray and sing our final song here and bring great praise and glory to you. In Jesus' name.